Thank you. Please be seated. God bless you. I was wondering who he was introducing there for a while. It's good to be home. We, we have a tradition at Restoration where I come at least once a year, but we missed the tradition last year. Due to my fault, Pastor invited me. I was supposed to come, and, and something happened, and he was gracious enough to to accept my excuse, and I apologize that that happened, but thank you. But it's good to be here. Amen. Say hallelujah. I know you're having another service this afternoon at 4, so I'll keep you until 3.30, and then <laughs> that way you don't have to go home and come back. You can just stay. Amen. But I was saying to Robert when he picked me up, there's a service this morning, there's a service this afternoon. I know, knowing church folks, some have chosen which service they're going to attend. But I'm going to believe that you're going to come to the one this afternoon as well. In Jesus' name. Amen. 20 years restoration, that's something to celebrate. Yeah. That was weak. 20 years, that's something to celebrate. 20 years, that's something to celebrate. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I was looking at the choir. You know, a lot of faces I don't remember. So either the Lord has added a lot more people or I have a bad memory. I don't know which one. But I want to think God has added. Amen. And I want to give God praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I know this is the 20th anniversary for restoration. Uh, but it's always important when we celebrate the church's anniversary that we celebrate the anniversary of those who have paid the price especially those who God used to found the ministry. I think sometimes we forget uh, to say thank you to, to people who paid a price and who allowed God to use them. You know, there's a, there's a story in the Gospels where Jesus heals ten lepers. And then he tells them to go to the temple and show themselves to the priests. And as they're going, they're healed and Nine of them proceed to the temple and give God thanks, which they should do. Give God praise, which they should do. But one of them remembered that while it was God who healed them, he didn't do it all by himself. That, that God chooses to work through individuals. And that there was a man called Jesus of Nazareth who, if he had not made himself available, they, he would not have gotten healed. So while giving God praise, he made it his business to also go and personally and tangibly say thank you to Jesus of Nazareth who allowed himself to be used as a channel through whom he was healed. And while Jesus didn't say to them, now you go and praise God, but make sure you come back and say thank you to me, those who God, use, uh, God uses uh, often will not request that. They'll do it because that's their, it's a joy, it's, it's a calling. But obviously Jesus appreciated the fact that one person out of ten appreciated him enough to say, I praise God, but pastor, I want to say thank you for allowing God to use you. <laughs> Amen. I, I don't know, I don't know what our tradition is here at, at, Restoration, but I hope the tradition of restoration is that we give praise to God, but we are also grateful for our pastors. And that we make time and take time uh, to say thank you in a tangible way. You guys are kind of quiet. So I, I don't know what's planned for this week, but, but I came, Pastor Felix and Katani, to say thank you. So I'll give you my personal gift um, because you made yourself available and we wouldn't be here. And that's a fact, people. It's a fact. Amen. If you're being blessed, if you're being strengthened, if you're being encouraged, if you're being ministered to here at Restoration, you wouldn't be receiving any of those things here if these two hadn't said yes and paid a price. Amen. 20 years ago and still paying a price to be here. So I want to encourage you. Make it a part of our tradition. 
as individuals do it all the time, but as a church, set aside time every year to say thank you. I mean, I'm blessed that our church every year, they set aside time to say thank you. I'll do what I do without it, but it sure makes it easier. When you know the folks you're serving appreciate what you're doing. You would want to be appreciated. You feel bad when you serve folks and do things, and they don't even say thank you. They just take you for granted. Don't you? Come on, be honest. Well, put yourself in the shoes of your pastors. Don't treat them the way you don't want to be treated. You know, I'm supposed to be the, the bishop. So I, I get to say those things. <laughs> Amen. So please, if you, I, again, I hope you've planned that. But if you haven't, it's not too late. Show some tangible appreciation to your pastors for the 20 years of their lives, which they've invested to this church and all the time they've spent preparing to be able to do that. In Jesus' name? Amen. All right. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to minister your word. Thank you for giving me utterance and giving your people understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. I just got back from Africa on Friday night and then flew here yesterday. So if I'm kind of slow today, just understand. Amen. I, a little bit of jet lag is still, still there, but... How many of you know, let the weak say I am? He's my strength in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Appreciating the past, aligning the present, anticipating the future. Everybody say that. Appreciating the past, aligning the present, anticipating the future. Okay? And so this is what we're doing this week. And so that's why I've chosen for my text this, this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called his name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. Let's say that together. Thus far the Lord has has helped us. Amen. So Samuel in this chapter is erecting a stone of remembrance which he calls Ebenezer. The occasion for this um, uh, memorial is the deliverance that God has just wrought for Egypt, I mean for Israel, delivering them from the domination of the Philistine. And this is the first time in Israel's history that they had ever experienced victory over the Philistines. And so Samuel undertakes to erect a memorial. Say a memorial. He calls this memorial Ebenezer. And, and there's a reason he's done this, a reason that is relevant, I think, for us this morning. Samuel erects this memorial because he knows what every pastor knows. He knows what every man of God knows. He knows that God's people have a tendency to forget. So let me try over here. He knows that God's people have a tendency to forget. Uh, to forget where the Lord has brought them from. To forget how many times they've cried out for help and he showed up. To forget how many times he's delivered them. And sometimes from things they didn't even know they needed to be delivered from. Yeah, they forget how many times he's heard their prayers and how many times he's blessed them even though they do not deserve it. God's people have a tendency to forget how good God has been to them, especially when it's time to worship him, especially when it's time to serve him with their talents, with their time, and with their treasure. They, they have a tendency to forget 
how good God has been to them when, when it's time to give. Turn to your neighbor and say, do you have a tendency to forget where God has brought you from and how many times God has helped you and how much you still need God? Yeah, yeah, we, 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 we forget or, or, or we act as though, well, okay, what he's done is not all that. That he should expect so much for me in expression of gratitude. And so knowing the tendency that we have to forget God's goodness and to act as though God's never done anything for us or what he's done for us doesn't deserve our all. Uh, uh, Samuel decides, I'm going to put up this memorial in order to help you to remember. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't forget to remember. Don't forget to remember where he found you. Don't forget to remember where he's brought you. Don't forget to remember, had it not, had it not, had it not been for the Lord on your side, where would you be? Yeah, yeah. Appreciating the past means that we should make it our business to remember. And, and, and remembering is important. That's why Jesus made it his business to establish what we call the Lord's Supper. Because he said, as often as you eat this bread and you drink of this cup, you're going to remember. So he set it up because he too knew our tendency is to forget. So he set up this memorial called the Lord's Supper and said to us, you know what, partake of this often. Because every time you do so, it will help you to remember how I saved you. How I died for you. How I shed my blood for you. You will remember how far I was willing to go for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, this is why on Sunday we gather. We call this the Lord's Day. Again, God is helping us set aside time. Because of our tendency to forget. To remember how good he is has been. And that's why every Sunday you ought to find yourself gathering together with the people of God in order to remember God's goodness, God's mercy, God's kindness, and together give thanks. And that's why I recommend that you take some time and just Write down, count your blessings, name them one by one. Take some time and just write or put that in your computer or your iPad, wherever you, you choose to do. The things that you remember God has done for you over your lifetime. The things for which you are most grateful. And then make it your habit on a regular basis. Perhaps a few minutes each day or at least once a week to simply set aside time to do nothing but recall and remember what God has done for you. You will find that tremendously helpful emotionally, and tremendously helpful spiritually. You will find that very inspirational and very strengthening and very motivational. There's so much that happens in the world that you can lose sight of your God and of his faithfulness. One more time, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't forget to forget. Don't forget to remember, excuse me. Now, 
I'm so glad that, that we are here today because you know what? That's what church anniversaries are for. Church anniversaries are for helping us to remember. Thus far, the Lord has brought me. I'm so glad that I'm not where he met me. No, no, no. The Lord has brought me a mighty long way. And from what I can see, I'm much better off. Oh, yeah, much better off spiritually than I was when he met me. Much better off emotionally. And even financially. Amen, I'm much better off. it. And, and I, if I had the time, I would tell you in very concrete terms and give you testimony after testimony after testimony of all the Lord has done for me. And I'm sure that many of you are here this morning that will say, same here, Bishop. Same here. I can tell you, Bishop that I am not where I was when the Lord met me. I was, I was lost. I was wretched. Amen. I was on my way to hell. But, but when the Lord laid his hands on me, my goodness, the best thing that has ever happened to me and the best thing that has ever happened to you is that the Lord met you and has brought you where you are. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. But, but, but my purpose this afternoon is not to talk, or this morning is not to talk about you or me. Yeah. It's to talk about restoration. Yeah. And thank God. Yeah. The Lord has brought restoration a mighty long ways. We're here celebrating 20 years. Restoration isn't where she was 20 years ago. I was just asking Pastor Felix 20 years ago, restoration met in their house, a handful of people. 20 years ago, restoration had a pastor who had ambition and vision, but probably that was all he had at that time. <laughs> Not, had a lot of learning and, 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 and a lot of experiences yet to obtain. But look at where restoration is. This morning, just look around. Come on, let's let's appreciate our past. Let's just look around and see how far the Lord has brought us. Let's see what the Lord has done. It's marvelous in our eyes. We take it for granted, but ladies and gentlemen, let me, as one who is not here. Let you know. Because sometimes when you're in something and you're part of something, you don't fully appreciate it. So let me inform you that you have come and the Lord has brought you a mighty long way. You are part of a great church. Amen. And God is doing some awesome things here. You ought to be grateful. You ought to appreciate. You ought to give thanks every day for restoration and for your pastors and for this community, this church community that God has made you a part of. Don't take this for granted. Are you hearing me? Because what you have here, many wish they had. I remember the first time I walked into restoration many years ago now, Pastor Felix was teaching. And my, how blessed I was. Do you know how many churches wish they had a pastor as gifted as yours? Who oh, you can come any Sunday and know you're going to get a word from God that is sound, exegetically, it's, 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 Consistent with scripture. Oh my goodness, don't take that for granted. You know, you know what, you know what? I just think you ought to stand, raise two hands to heaven, take 10 seconds, give God some thanks and praise for your church. Come on, just stand, take 10 seconds, give God some praise. Come on, give God some praise for this church. Yeah, Lord, I give you thanks for my church. 
I give you thanks for our restoration. Thank you, Lord. And forgive us for taking for granted this awesome thing you have done for us and made us a part of. You may be seated. Hallelujah. You hear now. This is not to suggest that it's been easy or smooth and without problems. Thus far, the Lord has brought us. This is a journey. And as with most journeys, there are hills and there are valleys. There, there is turbulence. I, 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 you know, I flew from Maryland yesterday, and the first hour and a half, nothing but turbulence. Now, I like it when it's smooth. I don't care too much for turbulence. But literally, for the first hour and a half, just turbulence and turbulence and turbulence. But look, I'm here. In spite of the turbulence, I'm here this morning. Amen. Thank God. Amen. And, and, and the, the flight yesterday was, was bad, but nothing compared to one that I was in in November <laughs> in, in Africa. Uh, I was going from Ghana, I think, to Monrovia. No, to Freetown. No, yeah, the Freetown to Ghana. And for the most part, with the, with the flight yesterday, it started off bad. And for an hour and a half, it was, with that flight, it started off smooth. And for the first hour and a half, it was smooth. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, like from nowhere, my goodness, we were in the midst of turbulence, and this was severe. Now, this was the first time I heard people, I know some folks are just naturally nervous whenever there's turbulence. Anybody here get nervous? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but, but you kind of keep it to yourself. You kind of try to pretend that you're not nervous. Some folks will say, <laughs> but on the inside, you're praying, right? But with this one, literally, people were screaming. Amen. I didn't know there was as many Christians in that plane as there. Because <laughs> I didn't hear anybody mention Jesus until we got in the turbulence. And man, a lot of people were crying, Jesus, Jesus. One guy behind me was shouting, Jesus, what's happening? What's happening? What's happening? Yeah, it was, it was severe. But we landed. Why? We landed because the pilot is trained to handle turbulence and the plane is built to handle turbulence. Are you listening to me? So like that Southwest flight yesterday and that other flight in November, restoration You've had your share of turbulence. You know what I'm talking about. Some have been mild and others more severe. But guess what? 20 years later, you didn't hear me. I said 20 years later, in spite of the turbulences that you have gone through as a community, you are here. And from what I can see, you're doing well. I mean, you've had your share of turbulence like, Pastor, when, did, when were you diagnosed with that cancer? 2008. The devil tried to take your pastor out. But you came together as a church. You came together as a community. I, I suspect perhaps that was one of the times when you were more united and more together than ever before. You came together because you identified an enemy and together as one community, you prayed, you believed. And look what God did. So, so yeah, restoration, I'm sure there are many other things we could cite, but you've had your, 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 your experiences with turbulence. But I want you to look at where you are today. And let the fact that you've gone through so many different kinds of turbulence over the 20 years, the fact that you're here, remind you that the captain that is flying this plane is well able to handle the turbulences. He's proven for the 20 years that you've been in existence that he's able to handle any type of turbulence. And so as you anticipate your future, 
You should be able to anticipate your future without fear. Because you know that he is with you and you know that he is in charge of this journey. And it is he who has said, not only is he able, but even the vessel, the ship, the, the, the craft, the church that he is leading and that he is building is able to handle turbulence. Think it not strange when you encounter various tests and trials. That's part of the journey. Turbulence is not normal. But this is what he says, upon this rock, I will build restoration church. Upon this rock, I will build restoration fellowship. Upon this rock, I will build my church. I will build my church. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Say to one or two persons upon this rock. Jesus is building his church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail. If he's able, if he has been able to bring you through all that he's brought you through for the last 20 years, there's no reason to doubt that he will bring you through whatever you may face tomorrow. So let me just encourage you as one who have had experiences with turbulence for 20 years, the next time you encounter one, relax. Don't be nervous. Don't be afraid. Don't say, I need to get out of here. I need to leave. I can't handle this. No, 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 no. Demonstrate enough confidence in the one who is leading and building his church to remain calm, cool, and faithful. Knowing that he has a way of making all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Say to one or two persons, he's able, he's able, he's able. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, over the years, God has shown that over and over again, this is his work and he's with you. A stranger, a stranger gave land worth more than $2.3 million to this church. Turn to your neighbor and say, God must be with us. Mm -hmm. The city of Aurora provided financial assistance to allow you to relocate. I know some of you are new and you probably haven't heard this. So I'm taking some time. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. When, 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 when restoration was moving from where they were to where they are, God caused the city of Aurora to provide financial assistance. Now, you, that doesn't just happen. The city doesn't just give money to churches. It seems to me that's an indication that God is at work and this church is the, a church that he himself is building. Major donors contributed over $250,000 to the financial future of this church. Did you know that? Did you know that? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, sometimes talk to your pastor. I say, Pastor. You know, I don't appreciate as fully, I think, all that God has done. Could you just take a few minutes and just tell me about our community? And remind me, Pastor, that this isn't your work. That you're just a servant, that you're just a minister. But actually, this is God's work. And, and remind me, Pastor, that you're not doing this for yourself, but God has called you to do this for us. Thus far, say with me, thus far, the Lord has brought us. So we have a past, but it, 
also indicates that this is a journey that is taking us into the future. So as our theme suggests, it's important that we appreciate the past, but we must also do what? Anticipate our future. Eagerly anticipate the future that restoration has, that God has planned for restoration. Now the Bible word for eagerly anticipating the future is hope. So we're talking about hope. God said, I know the plans I have for you, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. The importance of hope to a believer and to God's purpose for earth and for eternity cannot be overemphasized. It's important that God's people on a journey like the one you're on have hope. It's important that you are able to look at the future and eagerly anticipate where God is taking you to. You see, hope gives us the tenacity to persevere when the present is tough and when things are hard. Hope causes us to keep going when it seems little progress is being made. And sometimes on this journey, it seems like we're moving backwards instead of forward. That's when hope must kick in. And the future that God has promised us gives us the tenacity to persevere and to continuing. You see, it is hope that caused Jesus to resist temptation, even to the point of shedding his blood. And it is hope that will cause us likewise to endure the hurts, suffer the pain, the, be the betrayals, yes, even the bleeding that we must sometimes do in order to see God's will done and God's purpose fulfilled for his people. Uh, you didn't hear me. But the Bible says Jesus resisted temptation to the point of even bleeding to see God's purpose done. And it was for the joy set before him that he was able to endure. And there are sometimes, brothers and sisters, as we do God's work and as restoration does what God has called it to do, and as you, members of this community, are doing what God has called you to do, sometimes you're going to have to endure some tough, 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 tough situations. Sometimes you're going to have to experience and keep going on hurt, betrayal. And sometimes you will have to be willing to bleed to fulfill the purpose. I know you, you know, I know you wish I was making you shout and say hallelujah, but, but, but I really want us to talk. Yeah, 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 yeah. This work, this mission, like that which Jesus was called to, is too important yeah. for us not to be willing yeah. to sacrifice yeah. Yeah. for it. Yeah. Yeah. Say to sometimes, like Jesus, you may have to shed blood. Talk to somebody. Talk to them. Tell them. Sometimes you're not talking. Like Jesus, you may have to be willing to shed blood. Now, maybe not physical blood. Maybe not physical blood. Hopefully not physical blood. But blood represents your life. It represents sacrifice. Mm -hmm. What is it that will cause me to be willing to sacrifice Keep persevering, endure the hardships and the difficulties that sometimes accompany ministry. What is it going to enable me to be able to shake off the pain in spite of the fact that I'm hurting, to remain faithful to the mission, to the call, to what God has called me to do? You know, what would cause me to keep persevering and not just, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to step back and just, you know, I'm no longer going to risk getting hurt again. What is it? It's a clear vision of the hope, the, 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 the future that God has planned for us. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. I know the plan I have for you individually, but I also know the plan I have for restoration. It's a plan for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Do you know the plans God has for restoration. When was the last time you considered the plan? 
What was the last time you looked at the future? When was the last time you seriously considered the hope? Enough for you to give thanks to God for it. Enough for you to get excited about it. Enough for you to say, you know, I'm going to do my part to see this happening. Do you know that your future includes not just Restoration Christian Fellowship, this wonderful church that is meeting your spiritual needs? Do you know that the future God has planned for you includes uh, an academy? Do you know that? In order to serve the, the, the educational needs of, the, of this community, the church, as well as the larger community that you're a part of. Do you know that is part of the future? Yeah, yeah. Do you know it includes a recreational center? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know that it includes Operation Nehemiah? Yeah, yeah. Huh. Huh? Do you know it includes, Pastor, what are some of the other ones? Yeah, the, the Enterprise Center. Huh? They help you with your with your financial and vocational needs. Come on, say Bethel, uh, Bethel. <laughs> Restoration, <laughs> Christian fellowship, spiritual needs. Restoration Academy, educational needs. R Operation Nehemiah, social needs. Community center, Community needs. That's an event center. Yeah, yeah. Enterprise center. Enterprise center. Yeah, yeah. Vocational. Yeah, financial. Yeah. 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 And you thought this church was for him? <laughs> and you thought, you're, do you understand? But you know what? It's not even just for you. In reality, God is calling you together yeah. to create this future yeah. for your children and your children's children, but also for this community at large. If you haven't taken the time to consider and anticipate the future God has for this community, may I encourage you to do so? Because if you don't, you don't know what you are a part of. And when you don't know what God has called you to do and you can't see the picture clearly, it's so easy to quit. Okay, I'm going to, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm putting you to sleep, but, but I'm, say anticipating the past. No, appreciating the past, excuse me. My brain is still sleeping. Appreciating the past, Appreciate the past. anticipating the future. Anticipating. And the future God has for, for restoration yeah. is amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. And God, if God has brought you here, God has brought you here because he wants you to be a part of creating that future. Amen. Amen. And you and I ought to consider it a privilege Amen. to be a part of something so awesome that God is doing. Yeah. 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 Good. Now, thus far the Lord has brought us. So, we're not where we were. And we're not where we're going. We're on our way there. Which means right now, which is the present, we're in an in-between place. So what do you do when you're at an in-between place? You align the present. Yeah, you take the time to appreciate the past. You take the time to anticipate the future. And then you ask yourself, what am I doing right now in the present? That reflects my appreciation for the past, but that fully takes into account where God is taking us. So right now, what we ought to be doing is aligning the present to ensure that we stay on course and 
that whatever God has called us to do is done on time. Say on time. So hear me. There are four areas that I believe we ought to be examining as we align the present. Say A. Attitude. B. Beliefs. C. Confession. D. Deeds. Let's align the present. First of all, by examining our attitudes. Is my attitude, is your attitude aligned with the past that we're grateful for, the future God is taking us to? Is my attitude, what am I thinking or how am I thinking about and how am I responding to the other members of this community? How am I responding to my leaders? How am I responding? How is my attitude towards the purpose and the plan? Have my attitude gone astray? Is my attitude contributing to where we're going? Or have I allowed my attitude to become a hindrance? We got to align the present because the future is too great. And so I want to make sure that my attitude is what it needs to be so that God can work with me and God can work through me and God can work with us together to accomplish his purpose. So church, I'm saying to each of us as we celebrate the 20th anniversary, listen to me. Let's check our attitude. Let's examine our, our attitudes to make sure that the attitudes that we have towards one another, the attitude we have towards our leaders, and the attitude that we have towards the vision of this church is one that is consistent with what God is doing and one that adds to what God is doing and not subtracts from it. You know, the Bible says, let this attitude be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who although he was in the form of God, did not think equality with God as something to hold on to, but what did he do? Humbled himself and became a servant. Is my attitude here at restoration that of a servant? Or am I walking around and carrying myself as though I'm a master who is here to be served? Say, Lord, help me. Align my attitude with the vision, with the purpose, with the plan you have for this community. Ah, beliefs. What am I believing? You know, Israel didn't enter the promised land because the Bible says they didn't mix their faith with the word. So come on, let's align our beliefs. Am I walking by faith? Or am I walking by sight? Come on. Am I believing the promises God has made concerning this ministry? That which is in the word and that which has been proclaimed and declared from this pulpit? Am I mixing my faith with that? Am I still believing that he who has called restoration is faithful and he also will perform it? Am I believing? Is my belief consistent with what God is doing. Am I still walking by faith? And if I'm not, then you know what? Let's align our belief. Let's get back to believing that the God we serve who called this church into existence is faithful and he also will perform it. Hmm? Now what about your confession? What are you saying? What kinds of things are you saying? Have you gone astray in your words? Are the words that you're speaking concerning this vision, concerning this community, concerning God's plan and purpose, are those words bringing the church and the community together? Are those words strengthening this community? Are those words causing us to band together because that's what it means to be in alignment? to come together, to join forces together, are the words that we are speaking strengthening one another and empowering each other, edifying one another in order to fulfill a vision? Or are the words we speak divisive? Uh, what have you been saying? Let's examine that and align 
our confession, align our words with what God is taking us and with where God has brought us from. What about your deeds? What about the actions you're taking? What about the things you are doing? Are they in alignment with where God has taken us? Or have you gone astray in your actions? Are your actions adding to or taking away from what God is doing? Have you seen that this vision calls for teamwork, calls for everybody to join forces, calls for us to be in agreement, calls for each member to bring and to give and to contribute his full quarter. Have you seen that? And having seen that, are you contributing your time, your talents, and your treasure to this vision? Have you realized that your lack of involvement, your lack of participation, your lack of contribution is actually contributing to a delay in what God has called us as a community to do? Attitude, say that. Beliefs. Confession. Deeds. Let's bring all of that in alignment with where God is taking us and where God has brought us from. And, and how, how important this is, you can learn from Israel's example how important it is that we be in alignment. God brought them out of Egypt. God brought them into the wilderness. And God's plan was to take them into the promised land. But many in the congregation allowed their attitudes, their beliefs, their confession, and their deeds to go astray. Got out of alignment with God's plan and purpose. They begin to complain. They begin to murmur. They begin to say, we wish he had never taken us out of Egypt. They begin to say all kinds of things about Moses. Are you hearing me? They begin to speak doubt and unbelief. God said, here's the promised land. They said, we're not able. They said, we're like grasshoppers. And when your attitudes and your belief and your confession are wrong, your actions, your deeds are going to be wrong. And they did all kinds of stuff they shouldn't have done, even to the point of creating an image to worship. They were out of alignment. Here was this problem God had. Here was this wonderful future God had for them. But many of them allowed themselves to get out of alignment. And the result was costly for them. They literally put themselves in a holding pattern. That lasted for 40 years. It's a terrible thing to get stuck in one place spiritually because you refuse to come into alignment with what God is doing with you and with the community that you are a part of. I'm preaching better than you're listening. I don't care how you look. Now, as bad as it was for them to be stuck and in the holding pattern, what's even worse was that not only were they stuck, because they were not in alignment, they actually effectively succeeding, succeeded in having God, his plan, in a holding pattern. And God literally had to delay what he was doing for 40 years until he could find a replacement. You all aren't saying amen on this side too much, so let me come to you. He literally had to put himself and his plan in a holding pattern for 40 years until he could find a replacement for that generation that refused to be in alignment with what he was doing. So yeah, we can't significantly delay the future God has for restoration. If those of us who are here refuse to come into alignment. We can significantly delay that. My prayer, and I know God's desire for you, is that none of you will be a cause for a delay. And that it won't be necessary 
for God to find a replacement for you. To accomplish his purpose, because he will accomplish his purpose. But my goodness, I pray that he accomplishes his purpose through you and 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 through you. Amen. Hallelujah. I pray that he is able to accomplish it and he does not need to replace you. You ought to be saying, I refuse to be replaced. I refuse to be replaced. Amen. In Jesus' name. No, no. God wants to do something. God is doing something. God will do something through this congregation. But hear me, if I read the text correctly, we can delay. We do have a part to play in terms of the timetable. So if I'm not going to be, if you're not going to be a cause of delay, if God is not going to have to find a new assignment or, 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 or find someone else to, to fulfill your assignment, then you know what? You've got to make a decision right now, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're going to examine your attitudes and you're going to align them. You're going to examine what you're believing and align them. You're going to examine your confession and align them. And you're going to examine your deeds, what you're doing with your time, talent, and treasure, and bring all of that in alignment so that that vision that God gave Pastor 20 years ago can be fulfilled on time. Everybody, thus far, the Lord has brought us. Say us. I'm about to land. I'm about to take you out of this turbulence I put you through. <laughs> Don't worry. We're going we're gonna to land safely. Amen. In the name of Jesus, we're going to learn safely. <laughs> So don't be nervous. Don't be afraid. We're going to land safely in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Say, thus far, the Lord has brought us. Say, us. That's important. I think one of the things the enemy has done that has hindered the church and not just restoration, but the church as a whole, is that there has been, in general, a loss of the sense of the corporate nature of God's plan and purpose for us as individuals. You see, many of us are focused upon God's plan for me, God's plan for me, God's plan for me. And we have been deceived into thinking that God can fulfill his plan for us all by ourselves. And we don't have to be connected to. No, 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 no. You see, there's some things God can do just with you. But there are some things that God is doing in the earth the nature of the mission, the nature of the purpose, the nature of the goal is such that it requires that God brings people together and tie their destiny to one another. There's just some things that just cannot be done by one person. And there's some things that God has planned for you that you will never enter in or experience or fulfill unless you understand that there is an usness about your purpose. And that for you to fulfill your purpose, you've got to be joined to, connected to others who you are one with and in agreement with, and together you're pursuing the same vision God has called you to. And thank God for Tom Brady. He's good, he's good. But Tom Brady can never and could never win a Super Bowl by himself. He has to have people he can throw that ball to who can catch it. And he has to have some folks who are willing to put themselves between him and harm's way and sacrifice for him to be able to throw that winning goal. Did you hear me? He can never win a Super Bowl by himself. And there are things that God is doing in the kingdom for eternity that, listen to me, cannot be done by one man. Yet God wants it done. And for that reason, he brings people together and joins them together and gives them a common vision, a common purpose, and said, together, you need to own that. And together, you need to band together, join forces. And together, you need to accomplish that purpose. NASA, NASA, the space agency, has done some incredible things. Landing spacecrafts on little rocks millions of miles 
away. It's amazing. Traveling for years and years and land that thing. That's not something one person can do. It takes hundreds of, of scientists and astronauts, thousands of people working together to make that happen. And what's true of winning Super Bowls and what's true of space travel is more true of the church and the purpose and plan that God has. Listen, the plan God has for this world and the plan God has for eternity requires that he brings us together and makes you a part of a body and calls all of you together to fulfill one mission. And you will never, you will never, I'm saying this with all the authority and conviction I can say, you'll never be what God has called you to be. You'll never do what God has called you to do individually. You'll never fulfill your purpose unless you understand the usness, the corporate nature of God's purpose and your purpose. Listen, we all must have a personal relationship with Jesus to fulfill our purpose, but equally so, we've got to have a personal relationship with his body. You don't just need a personal relationship with Jesus to fulfill God's purpose. You need a personal relationship with his body. Here's my arm. My arm is fulfilling his purpose. But this arm can never do what it's called to do if it was not connected to, joined to, fully integrated with my body. It has to be in position. It has to have a very intimate and personal relationship with this body God has joined it to for it to fulfill its purpose. If my arm becomes disconnected, disjointed, it will not fulfill its purpose. And what's true of my arm is true of you and true of me, baby. I didn't mean to say that. It came out that way. <laughs> I don't think I've ever said that from the pulpit before. That's the first time in my life Amen. I've ever talked that way from the pulpit. Hey, say hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I guess I was talking about intimacy. And so God wanted me to be very intimate in the way I talk. Say hallelujah. Say hallelujah. <laughs> but this, this, listen to me. You have to be. Hear me. If God has led you here, and I believe you're here today, he probably led you here. If you have made this your church, listen to me. You can't just be here. You can't be just loosely connected because an arm that is just loosely connected is really more of a problem. Are you listening to me? Yeah, it, it just causes a lot of pain. It, it, it just, you know what? It can't do nothing and you can't depend upon it. You're constantly having to pay attention to it, constantly trying to, to, to keep it from hurting and, and, and causing the rest of the body pain. So listen to me, you're not going to fulfill your purpose. I know you may have been hurt. We all get hurt. You've been bruised. It happens. But don't allow what has ever happened in the past to cause you to decide, I'm just going to hang on, but I'm not going to go all the way in. You'll never get healed just hanging on. And you'll never make all God has put on the inside of you just hanging on. And you won't be able to fully support the body God has made you a part of just hanging on. And you'll never experience the wonderful plan God has for you if you're just hanging on. So forgive. Receive forgiveness. If you got to receive healing by faith, receive healing by faith. Amen. But go ahead. Don't just hang on. Plug in. Develop an intimate and personal relationship with the body God has made you a part of. Be vested and invested in this work because this work needs you. This body needs you and you need this body. And that's the way God has designed it to happen.
in Jesus' name. Everybody, thus far, the Lord has helped us. Ebenezer, the Lord, the rock, the helper. Thus far, the Lord, the rock, the helper has brought you. Hear me. He who has brought you thus far will finish what he has started. So go ahead and look at your future and get excited about it. Because the fact that he's the helper means he's always going to be there. You're never going to have to face what you're going to face alone, church. He's always going to be there willing to help. And because he's the rock, he's always going to be strong enough. So with the helper and the rock, may God bless restoration. May God prosper you. May God fulfill his purpose for your life. In Jesus' name. Every head bow, please. Every eye close. Father, I pray for every man, every woman in this house whom you have brought and whom you have led to restoration. I pray that we will truly appreciate the past. That we will anticipate the wonderful future you have planned for us. And that as a result, each of us will align ourselves in the present so that your purpose can be fulfilled on time and for your glory. I pray for those who do need healing, those who are hurting. I pray that they will experience healing. And whatever fears they may have of commitment, Lord, that they'll overcome those fears and become fully committed to and involved in this work. I thank you, Lord, that you are faithful. All that you have planned concerning restoration, you shall fulfill. Thank you for Pastor Felix, Pastor Katani, and the elders and staff that lead this church. Continue to be their strength. Continue to grant them the grace they need to be all that the people need for them to be. Be glorified, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor.